What an absolute blessing it is, if for no other reason, to come to these Summer Youth Series events and listen to you guys sing. It is some of the best singing that I think any of us get. And you can kind of see why God gave us the blessing of music. I have a relatively heavy lesson tonight. Um, it can be a deep topic. It's especially important for those of you who are a little bit younger to hear because so many problems can be avoided when you're young relating to addiction. For me, uh, I've gotten a chance to meet some of you this summer. Some of you may have seen me out at Reach Week. Um, kind of filling in this summer as the youth minister of the Keller congregation. But I've had a, a lot of experience working with teenagers. I am a high school teacher at Fort Worth Christian, not too far from here. And I've even got a few students in this audience. They're not used to hearing this side of me because I probably taught them math. Uh, but some years ago, I taught Bible as well. And one thing that my wife would say is I can talk through anything. Every single job I've had involves public speaking in some way, it seems. Um, but I'll start with this, because years ago, it's been a while now, I started off as an attorney, and I spent, oh, about five to ten years, figured out pretty quickly it was not the job that I wanted to be in. But one of my first experiences was when I was still in law school. I had, a, had to do an internship to graduate from law, law school, and so our church over on the other side of town actually had a former district attorney of Dallas County. And so I talked to him and he set me up and I went and I interned down at the courthouse in downtown Dallas called Lusteri. The very first day I showed up, some little 20 something year old, not even quite attorney, I met by one of the district attorneys, the assistant DA. And he brings me into the elevator, takes me up to the top floor of the building, and shows me the offices where I'll be working in the afternoons. But then he gives me a tour, and he gives me some warnings. He said, you need to be careful when you're here. This building shuts down at 4.30. And when I say shuts down, you will leave this building, or you will be escorted out. I kind of, my eyes widened a little bit, and he said, well, let me tell you something. After 4.30, that's when all the police officers leave and there's no security in this building. And you do not want to be around this premises at that time. He pointed to a section of the office and he said, look over there. I glanced over there and on this big old portion of the carpet, there was a huge stain. He said, that happened last week after hours. Somebody got in an elevator made it up to the top floor of the district attorney's offices, found a person who was a witness in a murder capital trial, cut their throat and they bled out and died on the floor right there. And I just was shocked. What was that about? It was about a drug deal. How did that start? Probably with an addiction. Some of you may know this picture or may know this man's name. Those of you that are a little bit younger may only know him because they've done some documentaries on him, some even recently. He's one of the most notorious mass murderers in history, named Ted Bundy. As far as we can tell, by his own admission, he's killed over 30, he killed over 30 women in seven different states over about a, a four or five year span. Just a horrible, horribly, evil man who did horrible, despicable things. So why would I bring him up? He reached out when he was sitting on death row in a Florida prison to James Dobson from Focus on the Family. Many of you may know of his ministry. I'm not going to speak to Dr. Dobson's faith or doctrinal issues. We disagree with him in some points there, but he does have a wonderful ministry teaching parents and those of us who are adults how to raise kids, how to protect kids, 
in an immoral and dark world. I want to read an excerpt of the interview that Ted Bundy had with Dr. Dobson the day before he was put to death via electric chair. This is Mr. Bundy talking. I want people to understand this. Basically, I was a normal person. I wasn't some guy hanging out at bars or a bum. Or I wasn't a pervert in the sense that people look at somebody and say, I know there's something wrong with him, I can just tell. But I was essentially a normal person. I had good friends, I lived a normal life. Except for this one small but very potent, very destructive segment of it that I kept very secret, very close to myself and didn't let anybody know about. And part of the shock and horror for my dear friends and family years ago when I was first arrested was that there was no clue who I was. They looked at me and they looked at the all-American boy. I think people needed to recognize, or I think people need to recognize that those of us who have been so much influenced by violence in the media, in particular pornographic violence, are not some kinds of inherent monsters. We are your sons, we are your husbands, and we grew up in regular families. And pornography can reach out and snatch a kid out of any house today. It snatched me out of my home 20, 30 years ago. As diligent as my parents were, and they were diligent in protecting their children, and as good a Christian home as we had, and we had a wonderful Christian home, there is no protection against the kind of influences that there are loose in a society that tolerates the things we do. Dr. Dr. Dobson replied, Ted, outside these walls right now, there are several hundred reporters that wanted to talk with you. Mr. Bundy replied, yeah. Dr. Dobson, and you asked me to come here from California because you had something you wanted to say. You really feel that hardcore pornography and the doorway to it, softcore pornography, is doing untold damage to other people and causing other women to be abused and killed the way you did it. Mr. Bundy's response, listen, I'm no social scientist and I haven't done a survey. I mean, I don't pretend that I know what John Q. Citizen thinks about this, but I've lived in prison for a long time now, years. And I've met a lot of men who are motivated to commit violence just like me. And without exception, Every one of them was deeply involved in pornography, without question, without exception, deeply influenced and consumed by an addiction to pornography. There's no question about it. The FBI's own study on serial homicide showed that the most common interest among serial killers is pornography. He went on to note in other portions of that, that at about the age of 12, he was introduced to what some would call soft poor pornography. But after that, it grew, and it combined with an addiction to alcohol. And he said that when he combined those two addictions, he dived so deep into evil and sin, he was not able to escape. 12 years old. Please understand, for those of you that are here this evening, this was before we even had the internet. The ramifications of what he's talking about has been magnified by 10 or 100 times because now almost anybody at any time can have access to things that are this damaging. And a man who, in his own words, I'm not going to speak for him, I'll let him speak for himself. He's now, he was executed the very next day in 1989. These were the things that led him to fall from a love of God and to despair and evil beyond which any of us probably have ever known. So addiction is a real thing. It's a harsh thing. It is not something to trifle with. It is not something that is minor. It can destroy. So what are some of the common addictions that we face today? Well, I put the worst ones up top because they are the most destructive, but pornography or sexual immorality. It's not just pornography, but it usually starts there. 
Sexual immorality generally starts when we break that covenant with our eyes. And it turns to many other things that can be destructive. Very destructive. Right along with it, equally destructive are drugs and alcohol. Notice I put alcohol right there with it. If you have known somebody who is an alcoholic in your life, you understand what I'm saying. If it does turn into some of the harder drugs, yes, the effects can be a little bit more obvious, but I wouldn't say they're any less damaging than that from alcohol. Some of the ones you might not think about, addictions to money and power and prestige, you see that quite a bit today on social media. Uh, gambling, gambling can really derail people and lead them into great hardships. It's kind of along with that love of money or at least the possibility of it. But I'd say also shopping. Uh, maybe not as common, but some people just don't feel happy unless they have something new to use or to wear. And then some of the stuff that definitely affects you young people. I lump it all together with entertainment, but the exact same part of your brain that is stimulated in pornography is stimulated by those of you that do computer games. I'm not saying it's the exact same thing. I am saying the effect on your brain is really similar. That dopamine, that gives you a rush. And because of that, it can be very addictive. Um, those of you who have parents who have put some limits on some of these things, that's why. Try not to fight it. Try to let your parents set some boundaries. And then I added on their social media. That one's fairly new. Social media is pretty much less than a decade old. But I know people who have talked about how they get dragged in and they'll just go through for hours swiping and sliding that bar up and down on their phones. And it is some of these things particularly damaging when we carry it with us everywhere we go. And it's 24 seven in our possession. Again, that's why you young people, some of your parents may limit and require you to turn in some of these things, to leave open doorways, put computers in open areas. It's a protection feature. So what's the Bible have to say about addiction? We're gonna go through a bit in the Bible, if you've got your Bible available, whether electronic or in paper form, you might get it out. Um, these are some things you may want to mark down or at least pay attention to. We're going to start with Romans chapter 6 and verse 12. Romans 6 and verse 12. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Listen to the terminology there. That's from the ESV. I like that version for this particular verse. Most of uh, these verses, I'm going to be reading from the ESV except for one. Let not sin reign, control, dominate. Listen to some of those words. To make you obey its passions. Lust of the flesh are predominating there. But we're going to read a long, longer portion because how does this process start? God warns us. Turn back a few chapters to Romans chapter 1. It's a little bit of a lengthy verse. That's why I don't have it up on the screen, even an excerpt of it. But I want to read it. And I want you to see the progression of sin and some of the things that God warns us against. Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. We're going to read through the rest of the chapter. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of, of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God's eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so they are without excuse. For although they, although they knew God, 
They did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So the first step is a straying from God, turning to earthly things. Here it's talking about idols. We don't necessarily today worship as many graven images, you might say, in old terminology. Our idols are some of those things we put up on the screen earlier. Verse 24. So what did God do? Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. So God gave us up to unnatural passions. Starts with a glance, turns to sexual immorality, homosexuality dishonoring with our bodies. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, Boastful, inventors of evil, listen to this one, disobedient to parents. Throw that one in this list, guys. Who's your best protection against what we're talking about tonight? For most of us with godly parents, it is your parents. Let them help you with some boundaries. Foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Do you see that currently today, just watching the opening ceremonies of the Olympics? And doesn't this describe somebody like a Ted Bundy, Bundy who did all these horrible things? The evil just magnified and grew stronger and stronger until he could not control himself because he gave himself over to the sin. Well, the Old Testament has some things to say. If you turn back to Hosea chapter 4 and verse 11. I like the New King James Version on this. If you happen to have an electronic Bible, you might flip it to the New King James Version of it. I think it's a little bit more understandable. Pretty short and sweet, to the point. Hosea 4.11 reads harlotry, wine, and new wine. Enslave the heart. Listen to the imagery by those words again. Dominating, making us obey, enslaving. That is what addiction is. It is slavery to sin. And at such a level that we begin to be pulled away from God. And then finally, let's look at Proverbs chapter 5. Because how does this process happen? <laughs> we all struggle with sin. There's not a one of us in here, myself included, that hasn't struggled with sin. That doesn't mean that all sin is an addiction. It's when we become captivated by our sin. It's when the sin controls us, dominates our thoughts. Proverbs 5.22 has an interesting little word about this. The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him, and he is held fast in the cords of his sin. Well, think about this like a cord. The first time I look at an image that God does not want me to see, I'm not enslaved. But my attention has been drawn away from God. But then the next day, 
My guilt does not hold me back, and I go and I look at that image again. And I'm captivated again. And another cord gets wrapped around me. And then day after day, time after time, I keep adding another cord, and I keep wrapping the cord around me. Before I know it, I'm captive. Those cords have bound me tight, I'm captivated by this sin. It has broken down the feelings of guilt, the ability to have self-control over the lusts of the flesh, and now I'm addicted. Now, it doesn't have to be just with my eyes. Maybe as a young person, I'm in a crowd of people that I know maybe I shouldn't be with, and they offer me a little bit of alcohol. And just to act like I'm not any different, I take a sip. Or I hold it. I'm not doing anything wrong. It's no big deal. I'm not, I don't like alcohol. I don't drink alcohol. I work with teenagers every day for the last almost 20 years. Guys, I know most of you have faced a challenge very similar to that. Whether it's with alcohol or vaping or drugs or something similar. Pornography, we talked about. But all of a sudden, that one sip, oh, I didn't even feel anything. It's no big deal. And then it becomes regular drinking, and then all of a sudden, you can't function without it. Now, that addiction may not occur for years, but there are studies of people that are still teenagers that are already addicted heavily to just things like alcohol, let alone hard drugs. The cords bind you up. So there's a lesson. Don't add more cords. Let God's conscience keep you from continuing in such a thing. Well, there is an escape to. And that's what I want to talk about as we finish up the rest of this night because I wanted to share the total, absolute depth of what addiction can do to you. I think Ted Bunny is a good example of how far it can go. Guys, you got to stay away from it. He thought he was from a nice, loving Christian home. All of a sudden, he allows something to control him. That control deepens. He mixes it with another addiction. And all of a sudden, he's murdering people on a rampage across states. I guarantee you, if he were sitting here today and you asked him or we asked him, he would probably say, I can't imagine when I was 12 years old that first time it would ever lead me down this path to the electric chair. Some of you in here are already on that path. I'm not asking for you to identify yourselves or anything like that. But it is something that is attacking just absolutely destroying lives. It is captivating, especially you guys that are younger, because you don't have some of the defenses that those of us with a little more experience have. If that's you, God does have a pathway out. We're going to go through some features of it. But the first thing I would say, absent any and all of these things, get help. If I'm speaking to you and this touches your heart, find somebody that you know is faithful to God and share your struggle. You will be shocked that many older people have faced some of these same problems in their lives. They understand it. Even I, as a young attorney, I remember I was across town before I moved over to Keller. I remember taking a phone call from a friend of mine at church. I had known them since growing up at a church in a youth group. I grew up at the Waterloo Church of Christ over in Richardson. And I had known these people, gone to camp with these people. They were a little bit younger than me. They met at camp. They fell in love. They were married. And we ended up all going to the same church in Plano there for a time. All of a sudden, I get a phone call from the wife of this married couple that I grew up with. 
She said, Steve, I'm calling you because I know you're a lawyer and I don't know what to do. I'm not going to use names, but her husband was standing outside the door with a baseball bat. Hopped up on drugs, multiple other women, and she was calling me in fear for her very life of, I have no idea what to do. And I was in my mid to late 20s at the time, and I'm trying to figure out how to both spiritually and legally counsel this person through one of the most difficult times in their lives. The first thing we need to understand, and it's one thing that at least here at Keller I've been talking about with our youth group, we have to understand that we've got to put our minds on God. Look at Galatians 5, it's up there. For freedom Christ has set us free. What, did you hear all those words about slavery? What were we enslaved to? That's it. Sin. It dominates us. It controls us. It enslaves us. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. If you are baptized into Christ, you're free from sin. Don't let the cords ensnare you again. Oops. So the first thought is to get our minds pulled off of the world world and towards God, we have to be diligent to train ourselves into regular study of God's word. And I see it. I see it in myself. I've seen it in other adults. I've seen it especially among our youth. Do you pick up the Bible when you're not told to pick it up? Do you pick up the Bible when you're not in church? Do you pick up the Bible when you're not in a devotional, when you're not being told to by a parent or a friend or a minister? It is essential that we are people of the word and I see in myself and my generation, our knowledge of the Bible has retreated over the last few decades. You guys need to turn it around. The way you do so is you pick it up on your own. Turn to Psalm 119. It's right up there if you don't want to turn there. Pretty short little verse, but how can a young man keep his way pure? How do we avoid addiction and temptation and sin and that enslavement? By guarding it according to your word. God's word is an actual guardian for us. It protects our heart. It works like a filter. It depends on your personality, but some people like to study the Bible first thing in the morning. They get up, they like to read the Bible. It sets your path for the day. It's a little bit harder to sin when you get up, you start your day thinking about God, thinking about His plan for your life, reading about temptations and sin and godly attributes and purity. But then turn back to Psalm chapter 1. I don't have the full verse up there, but I want to read verses 1 through 3 of Psalm 1. This is one of my favorite verses. The guys here at Keller are probably tired of hearing it, but we just did a devotional where I used this the other day because it is powerful and we need to understand God's plan for us. Just the very first Psalm beginning in verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his, and here's the key word, his delight. Guys, are you delighted to think about picking up God's word? Or do you feel a little bit of an aversion to it? Uh, I don't feel like it. That's for something at church. Uh, you know, I've had enough Bible for the day. I went to church today. Listen to this. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Well, that's the other side of it. If you're more of a night person, perhaps you like to read at night. Well, God's work can purify out the world. All the junk that you dealt with, you then go to the Lord in meditation of Scripture and prayer. 
And we get to give some of that evil, some of the stains of sin and difficulty and hardship. Pull it away. But this one says, do it both day and night. In the morning to set our path, throughout the day to overcome hardships that may occur. And then at night to release the struggles of this word upon the, the shoulders of our Lord and Savior and our God who is so much bigger to handle all these things. It finishes up by saying this, and the imagery is so wonderful. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Think about a tree right next to a river. Think about some of these areas that have bountiful streams of water. Think about the Amazon where they get rainfall all the time. What happens to the trees? Those roots are so deep. Those trees get so tall and strong and the storms that hit that tree will not knock it over. That's us. That's your faith reaching down deep, grabbing on to God so that you will not let go when the temptations come. If you are struggling to get out of an addiction, you start reading God's word every day and all of a sudden you start putting down roots to say, not now, not this time. And then after you do it that one time, then the next time you can then say, no, I just read about this, not this time either. And then you replace the enslavement to sin with strengthening a relationship with the God that can cleanse us of sin. It's not just reading the Bible, although it's powerful. But we need regular and consistent prayer. If the only times you pray are when your parents say, okay, it's bedtime, let's pray. Or at the kitchen table, it's not enough. In fact, one of the best times to pray is by mixing it with study of God's Word. God's word is simply that. It's the way that God chooses to communicate with us. He wrote it down hundreds and hundreds of years ago. It is not tied by our culture or any culture. It's just as relevant today as at any time in history. That is the way God speaks to us. But if you want a relationship with anybody, you have to speak back to them. Many of us are better at the prayer side of things. But then we don't let God talk to us. Name anybody you've ever known that talks so much that you can't get a word in edgewise. Do you really think of them as a close friend? Well, imagine that all you're doing is talking to God. Dear God, please give me this. Give me that. Give me a good day. Let me have this. Help me with this. Everything else. And then God is desperate to talk back to you. <laughs> And you just leave the Bible sitting over there. We don't make friendships with our Savior that way either. You can't have a relationship with God that is one-sided. So let's see what God's Word has to say about prayer. Especially when we're facing enormous things like addiction and worldly enslavement. First turn to James chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. James 1 and verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. This is talking about wisdom, but is it wisdom knowing how to ask God for help to escape sin? This is not the only one. If you turn to Mark chapter 11, 24 and 25, Mark 11, 24 states, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive, 
if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Pray, and God says, I'm going to answer. And when you put James and Mark together, as long as you're praying for God's kingdom and his glory, which he wants your soul, he wants you to escape Satan and his lies and deceits. He will answer that prayer. It, you know, interesting fact, I've heard this years ago. I've looked all over, and I cannot find reference to it. But I heard this in a lesson some years ago, and I want to at least uh, share it with you all. I don't know where it came from, though. But I was told by, uh, in, in a sermon years and years ago, that alcohol, Alcoholics Anonymous, AA, it was originally kind of a Christian organization out of one of the denominations. It was started with God-fearing gatherings of people trying to escape addictions. It's become more secular over the years. If you do a search, you can see that, you know, it's really more of a secular organization. They actually tried to remove prayer, apparently, from their 12-step program. Guess what? They couldn't do it. From what I was told, and again, I wish I could cite something, I just don't have it with me, but from what I was told by a source that I trust, when they tried to remove it, their 12 steps didn't work. Does that tell you something about the power of prayer? That even people who may not know God, who may not follow God, may not know the gospel, they can't take prayer out of this idea to get out of their addictions. It provides us our focus. And then finally... Surround yourself with the right people. Any single person that's ever struggled, especially with a drug or alcohol addiction, will immediately say the first step for them was getting out of the crowd of other people involved in that addiction. And if they didn't remove themselves from those people who were glorying in that addiction, they had no hope. Well, God tells us this also. 1 Corinthians 15, I think many of us know, know this. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. I have seen this so many times over the years. And guess what, guys? For those of you that are younger, this particularly applies to you. Because right now, you are in the process of pulling away somewhat from your parents. And for the first time in your life as a teenager, you start to give more credence to your peers than you do to your parents. Do you see it? Do you see how you talk and want to be recognized by your peers more? If you choose poorly, they will drag you into sin and you may destroy your soul in the process. Coming out of sin is the same process. If you're struggling with alcohol, don't you dare be around people that drink alcohol. If you're struggling with pornography, do not put yourself around others that say it's not a big deal and share it with you. Do not be around anybody who is giving you drugs or vapes. Set limits and boundaries. Keep them away from you. James chapter 5 and verse 16. In full it states, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. This goes with prayer too, but now we're combining, surrounding ourselves with the faithful with that power of prayer. And not only do you put yourself in the comforting fellowship of others seeking God first, but then you get that righteous person that's praying for you. And it is powerful. You doubt me on this? You go look up Daniel. I love the prayer of Daniel. Daniel humbly goes to God and he prays and he says, God, we blew it. We deserve to be in captivity. We deserve it. Please, though, remember your faithfulness that we can return to the promised land. That prayer, God sends his messenger, his angel, before he even finishes the prayer. That's power. A godly man, God answered his prayer before he even finished saying it. He can do that with you if you need the help.
and your heart is turning to him. So let's wrap, wrap it up. The best thing you can do if you have not already done it, if you are struggling with sin and addiction, you need to stop ignoring the call of the gospel. If you have not been baptized into the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ, you are without hope. You will face this world with no help. And none of those things we talked about will be effective without accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Confessing Him and washing away those sins. That is the single greatest thing that any of us can do. If you are sitting here and you are struggling with this, whether it's tonight or soon, decide who you are. If you want to escape the terrors of this world, you cannot do it without putting on Christ in baptism, no matter what anybody says. If you've already been baptized, step by step, put God first in your life. Tomorrow morning, get up, open your day in his word and in prayer, even if it's just for five minutes, even if it's just in the shower, start your day with God and then work him into your life with prayer and meditation, studying his word. Seek the counsel of good believers who you trust, whether it's a minister, a parent, a mentor in the church, an older classmate who you trust and look up to. Find a believer who can help you and let them start praying for you. And to be honest, guys, confess your sin. You gotta unburden yourself because one of the greatest tools that Satan has is hiding things, keeping it hidden. Once you open up and you share it and you realize you're not alone, there's power. Philippians chapter four, verse eight says this, and this is our goal. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is an excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. How do we do that? Prayer, studying God's word, thinking about God, talking about God, talking to God's people, being here. I've heard so many times, well, I go to church every once in a while. Well, God just says, I only need to be here Sunday night. I know I'm preaching to the choir because you're here on a Tuesday night. But you need to be in one of these churches every single chance you get because it's our safe haven from the world. Don't forget, Satan is the chief of all liars and deceivers. He will fool you. Seek that help. Let's close in a prayer and then I'm going to turn it over to Brandon and he'll give instructions for where we go from here. Father in heaven, as we finish this lesson, I pray that you've been able to speak through me to these people that are here tonight. Lord, we struggle with sin. You know my sin. You have seen everything I have done wrong. You've even seen the evil thoughts that I've had. We all struggle with sin in this world, but we want to break those chains. We pray to you, Father, that any of us here that are struggling, you would give them strength from listening to your word and from being surrounded by the faithful. Help us to search for those deep truths, for those deep meanings, for that close relationship with you. Give us strength against the father of all lies and deceit. He's coming after us. He is that lion. He wants to devour our souls. He hates you, and he knows he can hurt you, even the immortal, perfectly powerful God by hurting your children. God, help us to fight back and to fight back with the spiritual weapons that we've been given. To always turn to you, to seek your will in all things. May we, God, someday sing some of these same songs. 
together in heaven. Lord, forgive us when we do sin. Help us to not be enwrapped or ensnared by those cords. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen.